Good evening, good evening everyone. My name is Jonah Lazowski, and I am so honored to be here tonight and to welcome you all to the JPEF 2019 Gala. I'm Lauren Feingold, a JPEF board member, and I am very happy and proud to be here from Miami, Florida, as we honor Jewish women partisans. Both of my... Both of my grandparents and my great uncle are Holocaust survivors. Like many of the people that we will hear from and honor tonight, my family too escaped Nazi persecution and were forced to live in the woods in unimaginable conditions. Disease, starvation, winters 40 degrees below zero, and the constant threat of being discovered. If not for the partisan soldiers, these brave women and men that brought them food, supplies, and information, I would not be standing here tonight. My grandparents, great aunts, and uncles were all partisans, and due to their bravery and sacrifice, I am here tonight. The partisans serve as a poignant reminder that no matter the odds nor the adversary, we must all do our part to fight back against injustice and hate, and that we can never, ever give up. Thanks to JPEF, this lesson and stories of these Jewish partisans have been shared with millions of students all around the world. Tonight, our focus is on women Jewish partisans. Although women made up about 10% of all Jewish partisans, their contributions were not only instrumental to their partisan groups, but they broke the gender norms for how women from the 1940s should behave. It's hard for me to believe sometimes. Jewish partisan women, women that look like my grandmother, Sarah Bedzo, were carrying weapons, changing their identities to carry reconnaissance missions and blowing up bridges. Talk about women empowerment. As the focus is on the women partisans this evening, we wanted to make sure that the male partisans and survivors in the room are also recognized. When I mention your name, can you please stand? Howard Kittenow, who celebrated his 90th birthday earlier this month. And his brother, Jerry Kittenow, My grandfather, Rabbi Philip Lazowski. And his brother, Robert Lesser. We are all so grateful to have all of you here with us this evening. We're sorry that Aaron Bell, the youngest Belsky brother, had to cancel his trip last minute as his dear wife came down with the flu, and we wish her a very quick recovery. Tonight, we are also honoring visionary philanthropist and incredible friend of JPEF, Diane Wall. Diane Wall, who has been instrumental in JPEF's powerful impact over the years, as well as Cantor Shira Ginsburg. <laughs> Shira, who has been a leader of JPEF's third generation, as we like to call 3G, outreach efforts in New York since the beginning and can lift the spirits of all of us in this room with her incredible voice. Our keynote speaker is an extraordinary scholar and author, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt. Who has continued to draw attention to the resurgence of anti-Semitism in the world today. Like so many other people, I am personally an enthusiastic fan of the movie Denial with Rachel Weisz 
that depicts Dr. Lipstadt's battle against a Holocaust denial. I wanted to acknowledge my fellow JPEF board members in the room, our, pre our board president, Elliot Felsen, founder, Mitch Graff, <laughs> founding board chair, Paul Orbach, <laughs> Linda Johnson, Evan Kletter, John Kushner, and Barack Warbo. It's nice when these events can bring us all together. Let's take a moment to look around this room. There are over 300 people here tonight. Give it a round of applause for that. 300 people. As Lauren said, we are here to honor Jewish women partisans, and none of this will be possible without JPEF. JPEF is the only organization in the world solely dedicated to teaching about the Jewish partisans. Without it, so many of these amazing stories would be lost. Furthermore, because of the devoted and hardworking JPEF team, millions of students all over the world are learning about the partisans for the very first time. We are all so grateful for the work that this great foundation and this great organization carries out. Currently, we are about $50,000 short of our fundraising goal for this evening. But there's good news because you can all help have an opportunity to push this across the threshold later tonight, and it's as easy as sending a text message. There's going to be more on that later, but in the meantime, we'd like to introduce JPEF president and the son of a Jewish partisan, Elliot Felsen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many familiar faces here tonight. And wow, what a crowd. And this room is more gorgeous than ever. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren and Jonah, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Elliot Felsen. I'm the son of Jewish partisan Don Felsen and JPEF's president. I thank you all for being here as we celebrate the women of the Jewish partisans. This is our 19th year as an organization, and we are thrilled to have such a great turnout. I want to give a special thank you to Deborah Lipstadt for being our keynote speaker tonight. I was honored this past summer to spend a week with her on an organized trip to Warsaw and Krakow. And Deborah, with the work that you're doing in the fight against anti-Semitism, I think it's more than fair to say that you definitely embody the spirit of the Jewish partisans. So thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Diane Wall and Cantor Shira Ginsburg tonight. Um, and Diane, I want to thank you. I know that Deborah's, uh has a very uh, busy schedule right now on her book tour. And Diane was very instrumental in, in getting Deborah here. So um, thank you so much. I am pleased to also recognize several guests who have been valuable resources to JPEF in our work. Uh, Anna Robel, historian, educator, and poet. Dr. Jack Porter of Harvard University, writer and social activist. Dr. Joshua Zimmerman, professor of history at Yeshiva University. Farda Uran, artist and author, and Holocaust uh, educator Fred Rosenbaum. I became involved with JPEF because I grew up hearing the stories my father would tell us of how he and his brother Stan escaped the Jewish ghetto in their small town of Gluboki and joined the Panamarenko Partisan Brigade operating in the forest near Minsk. I wanted to make sure others knew about the partisans as well and was honored to join JPEF's board right at the beginning. I am so proud of what we've accomplished and wanted to briefly share some of JPEF's recent accomplishments. We have trained more than 1,100 teachers in person in the last 18 months. From New York 
in New Jersey to Alabama and Wyoming, our material continues to be in high demand. We estimate that we are impacting more than 50,000 new students annually through our professional development opportunities alone. Not to mention the students we are reaching through our partners and our website. Over one million students learned about the Jewish partisans through Junior Scholastic Magazine's April feature, The Girl Who Fought the Nazis. The article is a result of JPEF's long-term partnership with Scholastic. Thank you, Scholastic. You may, you'll find a copy on your way out that you can take home with you when you leave. This spring, the ninth graders from the small town of Alpena, Michigan, made an exceptional exhibit on the Jewish partisans using materials from our website, which was on display throughout the summer at the City Museum. At our last gala, when director John Avnet, Avent spoke about his powerful film Uprising, chronicling the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt, we were all inspired. Since then, we produced a study guide and lesson plan on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and since June of this year, have hosted teacher trainings on the curriculum, including one in Poland. During the same educational trip, we trained 45 teachers from Pittsburgh and the Southeast through our partner, Classrooms Without Borders. They will now be giving our students a complete and accurate Holocaust education, one that includes Jewish resistance. The biggest news to share with you is the success of our partnerships. Five years ago, we realized that we can have greater impact and be better stewards of our donors' philanthropy while reaching even more students through partnership and collaboration. We empower many of the world's most successful Holocaust organizations to teach with our material and bring it to their constituents. This takes several forms, from helping the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center incorporate our short films as part of their permanent collection, to assisting with the newly opened resistance exhibit at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, where we provided crucial facts and maps that are now part of their permanent exhibit. In New York, we partner with the Museum of Jewish Heritage and the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. And across the Hudson, with the New Jersey Holocaust Commission. To date, we have over 45 partnerships. Through these relationships, we, each, we reach thousands of more educators and hundreds of thousands of more students each year. We have identified another 35 organizations that we are in conversation with to expand this further. And thanks to your support, this will be our primary focus next year. JPEF has had an international presence from the very beginning with worldwide use of our website, teacher trainings in Israel, Europe and Africa, and our traveling photo exhibit. Now, through a partnership with the Center for Educational Technology at Tel Aviv University, we will be translating all our films, study guides, and our website into Hebrew, Spanish, French, and Polish. Some of the funds raised from this evening will go towards this important project, and we are very, very excited about it. Thank you again for being here as we honor Jewish women partisans, and as a community, come together to bring JPEF to millions of young people worldwide giving them a more accurate pic picture of the Jewish experience during the Holocaust through the important and life-affirming history of the Jewish partisans. I would be remiss if I didn't thank one more person here that works very tirelessly for JPEF, 
and making this event incredible for all of us, and that's Sherry Rosenblum. Thank you, Sherry, for all that you do for JPEF. This is really an uh, amazing night, and we, have so, we are really indebted to you. I'm also uh, grateful, well, we already thank our board members. So again, thank you all for being here tonight. And I would now like to introduce a good friend of mine and JPEF's newest board member, Evan Clatter. Good evening and uh, welcome. Yes, it's uh, Elliot invited me uh, on the board earlier this year, and uh, you know I haven't thanked you publicly, but thank you so much, Elliot, for inviting me on this board. Um, this experience has been very fulfilling, and I'm very proud of the work that JPEF does. Uh, I found out a few years ago that I was related to uh, my descendants are in Belarus, and um, found some Holocaust survivors there that I was related to. Um, am I related to partisans? I don't know that yet, but I'm sure there's more to come about that. However, tonight is my privilege to introduce a short film about what else? Jewish partisan women, as we recognize their unique contributions. As you know by now, the partisans lived in the woods and had few resources. And I've seen those woods, and I've been there in Belarus, Nice for mushroom picking in the summer, not nice to live in in the winter. The women partisans defied traditional gender roles, and we can all imagine what those were like 75 years ago. These women fought the Nazis and their collaborators by sabotaging bridges and railroads. They also gathered food and medicine and tended to the wounded and guarded their camps. Their courage and perseverance saved lives. They were, as we say, in the vernacular, badass. Today, JPEF creates and distributes content, lessons, films, online testimonies that celebrate these women, therefore allowing them to be role models for current and future generations. Women, men, and leaders of all kinds can all learn from the stories of these real-life heroines. So without further ado, here's the film Jewish Partisans Jewish women partisans impacting the next generation, and I've always wanted to say this, roll the film. <laughs> the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation 2019 Gala, honoring women partisans, impacting the next generation. What's cool is the ladies did all this stuff. All these women were like, hey, no one will think anything of me. I'll just bicycle around and actually be a spy, right? Back then? I know. So in the middle of this, they're behind enemy lines. Okay, they're amazing. So they're all their yeah. stories. They're, they're recorded. Okay. They have their interviews. They have the questions. And then they also have the text. Okay, they have like the whole thing written out. So we followed up on the questions, like the same questions that the interviewers asked. Those become your research questions, all right? So you guys are gonna answer the question, like, how did they get involved? Why did they get involved? Maybe they didn't have any other choice. Maybe they they could, they weren't used. We were not interested in getting involved in open battle fights because we were not equipped or trained for it. We were interested in getting involved in sabotage acts to interrupt and disrupt the communication and transportation to the front. המטרה שלנו הייתה ללחום נגד גרמנים ולפגוע בהם בווילנה שידעו שאפילו בעיר הפרטיזנים מגיעים. וזה בעצם הייתה המטרה הכי חשובה בפעולה הזאת, לערער את הביטחון של הגרמנים. We took off the sentries by a silencer. We went in into the base and made a mess out of them. It's like an atom bomb erupted. While we are, we are 
we are going in into the base, a train was passing by. And we put it in the dynamite. The dynamite exploded, and all of them we were waiting with machine guns, and machine gun them, and they were the end of them. We went two girls. There was a little bridge that was uh, wood. And that little bridge connected the Germans to go from one town to another for ammunition, for food, for things like that. And we were supposed to burn that bridge. We came into the Russian village and we said we need kerosene and we need straw in five minutes. We haven't got, we haven't got. We said, if you don't have, we'll kill the whole town. Either you give us or you're gonna be killed. They gave us in five minutes kerosene and straw, and we put a fire underneath that bridge. The Germans saw it, a fire. They happened a fire on us with all the ammunition that they could do. We didn't chicken out. That bridge burned. When we came back, the commander said that we did it very good, and we got uh, order Lenina. A medal. I think women get um, short shrift in history in general. Um, it, I'm a historian, so this is a problem. It's the, the voices that don't get heard, the voices that don't get recorded. So women partisans are perfect. They are active. They're not passive. You know, they're they're taking control of their lives. They're doing things that are you know we find admirable, and they're doing it all with that that disadvantage or at least that stereotype that they can't. And I think that shows the young women of today and the young men that what you are determined when you are born can shift. You are control in control of your own destiny and you have the power to be part of something that you believe in. I think it's interesting to me because like there's a history of women like not having the same chances as men, especially in combat. And so I think it's really cool that like all these young women went out and fought. I was the girl who played soccer with the boys. I was a girl who rode a bicycle on the street with, in shorts, which another Jewish girl didn't do that. See, I was born a fighter. I am free. I was always free. When I was a child, my father used to say that I am Dangerous. I like teaching about the partisans in my classroom because it breaks down the stereotypes that they could be more than a mother, they could be more than a nurse. They could pick up the guns and they could be equals with all of those around them. I think it's really interesting because a lot of the people who I look up to just in life are women and I, it's just so interesting to learn about different, like, amazing things that women have done. I think it really encourages me just to know that I can do great things. The best thing you can do about this is to remember. Good evening. I'm Noah Blakeman, the grandson of Jewish partisans Chesha and Frank Blakeman. And I am Jordan Boyarski, the great granddaughter of Gertrude Boyarski. She's the woman in the green dress that you just saw in the film. And I'm Jonathan Carden. My grandparents were Jewish partisans Julia and Isidore Carden. Tonight, I'm grateful to share my Safta story and to honor all the Jewish women who resisted in so many ways during the Holocaust. In his notes from the Warsaw Ghetto, historian Emanuel Ringham, in his notes from the Warsaw Ghetto, historian Emanuel Ringham Bloom and the organizer of the Onek Shabbos resistance movement wrote, the future historian will have to dedicate an appropriate page to the Jewish women in the war. She will take up an important page in Jewish history for her courage and her steadfastness. By her merit, thousands of families will have managed to surmount the terror of our times. Yes. Jewish women, pardon me, resisted the oppression of the Nazis and their collaborators in countless ways. Through artistic expression, 
chronicling their experiences to leave an indelible record, protecting children, forging documents, and fasting on Yom Kippur, even when they already had no food, they resisted. When the Germans invaded her town and began rounding up Jews, my grandmother, Chesha, was responsible for hiding her younger sisters. At 16, after her family was sent to the labor camp adjacent to Sobador, she escaped the, into the forest with her brothers and joined the partisans. Joining the famed all-Jewish Greenspan group, she cooked meals for more than 125 people a day. When her brother was shot on a mission, she stayed by his side, nursing him back to health. And I am Jordan Boyarski, and I am 10 years old, and my great-grandmother Gertie, who was just a few years older than me when the Nazis raided her village, left alone after her family was killed. She was determined to join the partisans and fight back. As a young woman, the unit commander made her prove herself by standing guard outside the camp for two weeks on her own. Well, she did it. I'm so lucky that I had Gertie in my life when I was younger, and that I continue learning about how incredible she and all of the women we are honoring tonight are. Their stories encourage me to show the same courage and strength throughout my life. One day, when my grandmother, Julia grossberg Carton was 16 years old, she left home to run an errand and returned to find her mother dead and her father and sister deported to Belgius. Hitler's army had come all the way to her small, distant village of Militech, Poland, to destroy the only Jewish family living there. She bit my grandfather during one of his many dangerous missions, sneaking into the Burbuka ghetto, and escaped with him into the forest, where she joined the Schwerschewald partisan group. She lived, foraged, and fought with them in the woods for three challenging winters. By the end of the war, several other groups had joined the brigade, which ended up saving more than 400 Jews. Jordan, Jonathan, and I are grateful to JPEF for the honor of recognizing the incredible women of the Jewish partisans this evening. Give it up for that. We are so very fortunate to have five of them here with us tonight. While no token of our esteem could ever adequately convey our gratitude for the role that each of you played, each of you played, sorry, that each of you played in fighting the, for the survival of the Jewish people. Indeed, we owe each of you our very lives. JPEF has a gift for each one of you tonight. This pin represents the trees that sheltered you in the forest with a trunk that demonstrates the strengths of women and leaves the spell out of Eshet Chayel, as your name is read, please stand if you are able so that we can recognize you all. Rose home. <laughs> Ellen Cadino. Esther Kedano. <laughs> Lola Klein. <laughs> Essie Shore. There are several women who could not travel to be here with us tonight. We ask their families to rise and stand as we honor them. Sarah Bedzo. <laughs> Miriam Brisk.
Judith Ginsburg. Leah Johnson. Faye Shulman. Mira Shelub. Helen Terrace. We also honor the memories of those women who are no longer with us. We ask the families of these wonderful women to stand and honor them. Lily Boxed. <laughs> Francis Berger. <laughs> Haya Bielski. Lilka Bielski. Sonia Bielski. Gertrude Boyarski. My grandma, Chesha Blakeman. Paula Berger. Marissa Diena. Bronia Dubowski Colt. Sarah Fortes. Leah Freeberg. Sarah Jeanette Rubinson. Judy Gokowicz and Sonia Kidd. Julia Carton. Vitka Kempner. Leah Kotler. Ray Kushner. Ruth Lapidus. Helen Levitt. Sonia Lombrowski. And Sima Meckel. And Monka. Tova Nohomovsky. Tsenka Novak. Dora Oltuski. Sonia Orbach. Feiga Pochtik. Lisa Rebel. Ruth Resnick. Sarah Rosnow. Hannah Ryback. Brenda Sanders. Etta Robel. Rochelle Sutton. Sina Tenenbaum. Ida Zelwin. On behalf of Jordan, Noah, and myself, I want to thank JPEF for all the hard work they do and to exalt the memory of the survivors and the partisans who were with us and those who are no longer with us for empowering women everywhere and for teaching the generations to come the importance of speaking out against and standing up against hatred and oppression in all its various forms.
I'm sure our grandparents are looking down at us tonight, shepping a lot of nachas and smiling with all of you. During dinner, a member of the JPEF board will present the Eishet Chayel, am I pronouncing that right? Perfect. Pin to each represented family. And now, please stand and join us and Cantor Shira Ginsberg as we sing the Heim of the Partisans. Him of the Partisans, rather. Zognit kein molas du get tem let's in veg. Hosht him len blyen e far steel in blyeteg. Kuim in vet no hunze roiske bank to show. Svet up hoiked an unze trot mir sein in do. Von green im Palmenland bis weißen Land von Schnee. Mir kommen on mit unser Pein, mit unser Weh. Und wo gefallen sie, so spritz von unser Blut. Sprotten wird dort unser Gwurre, unser Mut. Svet die Morgen sun bei Gilden Sämt sind heint. Und der Nacht wird falsch finden mit dem Feind. Nur Räub versammeln wird die Sonne in dem Kajor. Wie a Parol soll gehen das Lied von Dor zu Dor. Das Lied geschrieben ist mit Blut und nicht mit Bläh. Sie ist nicht kein Lied von a Feugel auf der Frey. Das heut a Volk zwischen von die Gewehr. Das Lied gesungen mit na Ganges in die Hand. Zu sorg nicht kein Melas, du gehst dem letzten Weg. Hosht ihm den Bleien, er verstellt den Bleuetag. Kuh, mein Wett noch unser Eusgebänkte Show. Svet abheugt und unser Trott mir sein in Do. Kuh, mein Wett noch unser Eusgebänkte Show. Bank to show, sweat up, hoiked on unser trot, mir sein in do. It's better be a big holly, there are four of us here. <laughs> Where's the holly? Where My mother didn't bake this, so. <laughs> wow. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. Grandma, go ahead. Baruch. No. Amen. Come on, Rosie. Come on. So tough, Hala. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, great. All right, we have to eat a piece, don't we? Okay, yeah, we have to break a little hard, piece. It's hard. Yeah, we've got to eat a piece. It's hard. Thank you. You're welcome. You want a piece? <laughs> Delicious. Is it? Thank you. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Yeah. Hi, my name is Maya Sekans, and I'm the granddaughter, granddaughter of Jewish partisans Sesha and Frank Blakeman. Hello, I'm Eva Orbach, the granddaughter of Jewish partisan Sonia Orbach. And although Maya and I have just recently met, I feel like we know each other because our grandparents were lifelong friends, meeting not long after the war in Germany and becoming part of their close-knit group of survivors who had fought back as partisans during the Holocaust. Tonight, we are here to pay tribute to my grandfather, Frank, and Eva's grandmother, Sonia, both of whom passed away last year. Each played instrumental roles in the founding of JPEF and were among the first Jewish partisans to share their stories with Mitch Braff. We are also remembering our dear Stephen Holm, who passed away last month.
Born in Kamyanka, Poland in 1922, my grandfather was just 16 years old when the war started and the Germans began their systematic destruction of the Jews. Eventually escaping to the forest, he met up with other Jews and organized a defense unit to fight back. His unit continued to grow, and at 21 years old, he commanded more than 100 armed Jew Jewish partisans. His partisan group disrupted German communications, dynamited bridges and railroad tracks, and made hit-and-run attacks on trains carrying military supplies and soldiers to the front. He earned a reputation as a formidable leader and resistance fighter and was awarded the Cross of Valor after the war. In the foreword to my grandfather's autobiography, Rather Die Fighting, Sir Martin Gilbert wrote, it is a gripping story of suffering, endurance, and triumph against massive odds of the human spirit, which will serve as a beacon of hope for all those who wonder how good can ever triumph over evil in a troubled world. Indeed, throughout his life, and in every way possible, he demonstrated to me and to all of his grandchildren that good does triumph over evil. He showed us the importance of standing up for what we believe in and for living a life of purpose and ma'asim tovim. May his memory be a blessing. At age 16, my grandmother Sonia's life was turned upside down when the Germans invaded Poland. By 17, she was risking her life as a medic, tending to wounded partisans in her unit on the front lines. I have spent the last year since she passed away reflecting on the countless ways that her experiences as a, teenage, a teenager in the Jewish partisans influenced my life. She would often tell me and others when recounting the story of being on the battlefield with bullets whizzing by her head. If I was going to die, I was going to die as a fighter, not because I was a Jew. This demonstration of her tenacity and her resolve to make a difference was so powerful to me. From my grandmother, I learned about the power of human resilience. She and my grandpa Isaac and their whole community of survivors were first-hand witness to genocide and to the world turning its back on them. As a survivor, she could have succumbed to depression, cynicism, selfishness, apathy, or abandoned her Jewish identity. But instead, she chose to live a life of zest, style, elegance, community building, service, love, and connection with her Judaism. I am infinitely grateful that she was brave enough to tell her story to thousands of school children, adults, Jews, and non-Jews over the years. The story of resistance and standing up for what is right and defending one's identity is one that deeply resonates with me, and I would not be who I am today without her sharing that with me. May her memory be a blessing. And now a moment to remember my cousin Steve. Stephen Holm was a constant presence in my life for as long as I can remember. A dynamic, brilliant, and caring man, he was a wonderful father, husband, son, brother, and friend. At some point, I realized that my cousin Steve was a highly respected lawyer. Admired by all for his brilliance and his ability to structure complex real estate deals with such integrity that all parties on all sides walked away happy. While he loved his work, his family always came first. A tremendously devoted son, he had breakfast with his mother every morning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Steve was a modern day Renaissance, sorry, Jewish Renaissance man. <laughs> he was wild at heart and loved his cars and motorcycles. And yet at the same time, 
He had a Yiddish anemia, valuing his parents' history and the lessons they handed down to him. Steve was generous and it had an amazing impact on so many people during his life, offering wise counsel, encouragement, and always a joke just when you needed one. Steve was also the keeper of his parents' Jewish partisan legacies and worked closely with JPEF to ensure that young people worldwide learn from their wartime resistance. He was a true guardian of that mission. In 2017, Steve captivated those sitting in this very room as the MC of the gala. We all miss him greatly and will forever remember him as a truly exceptional mensch. To the Holm, Chardon, Lieberman, and Berger families who are here with us tonight, we say, Hamakom Yanachem Etem Betoch Sha'ar Avele Tzitzion Berushalayim. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> we would now like to present a tribute to Sonia, Frank, and Steve, narrated by Liev Schreiber. We pay tribute to three pillars of the JPEF community who we have lost during the past year. Sonia Orbach, Frank Blakeman, and Stephen Holm. My role was to be there to help if somebody is sick or wounded, to provide some help for that uh, person. It made me feel very good. It made me feel proud of myself to be able to be a partisan, to be able to help in any way I was able to, that mission to destroy the Nazi, Nazi machine. We were afraid of all of them, and we were afraid, not afraid of anything because it didn't mean anything for us. I can tell you one thing. We did not expect that we're going to survive. You know? And we knew we have to do what we have to do today. And we were not afraid to die because our families were gone. We were just trying to do the best we can. I am Stephen Holm. I'm the son of Rose and Joe Holm. Rose, my mother, is still here with us tonight. Unfortunately, my dad... My dad passed away in 2009, and both my parents had the honor and the distinction and the good fortune, as my father would have said, to have survived the war in the partisans, or in their terminology, in the woods. Always remember their important and valuable contributions to JPEF. Their guidance and their incredible support will have a lasting impact on advancing JPEF's mission for generations to come.
good evening. I'm Linda Johnson, the daughter-in-law of Leia and Velvel Johnson, Belsky Partisans. I'm Arielle Schub, and this is my sister, Tanya Johnson. We are the granddaughters of Jewish partisans Velvel Johnson and of Leah Johnson, one of the women partisans whom we honored here tonight. Those of you who know my grandmother know she is a strong, resilient woman shaped by her wartime experiences in the forests of Belarus. She is a force to be reckoned with. While she could not be here tonight, she was thrilled to know that we have the honor of introducing another force to be reckoned with, an advocate for the Jewish people, a scholar of the Holocaust, a fighter against anti-Semitism, and a pursuer of justice, Deborah Lipstadt. Tonight, we honor Jewish women who preserved women who resisted and, who, and women who fought back against the enemies of the Jewish people as Jewish partisans. Dr. Deborah Lipstadt is such a woman. As the years pass since World War II, Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism continue to plague our society. Holocaust deniers are virulently anti-Semitic and have an intense hatred of Jews. They plant seeds of doubt, negate what happened, and undermine the legitimacy of Israel. There are those who want to whitewash history and change the facts. Holocaust deniers are found in all elements of society today all over the world. JPIF plays a huge role in educating the younger generation of the facts of the Holocaust. We should not give in to those who wish to negate the facts of Jewish genocide. It is important to confront denial at every turn, to stand up and speak out. In 1995, two years after the publication of her book, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, Dr. Lipstadt found herself facing a slander suit from a Holocaust denier in England. Under British law, she was required to demonstrate that her characterization of the plaintiff as a Holocaust denier was true. During the ensuing five-year legal battle, Dr. Lipstadt revealed her tremendous tenacity, exposing the denier's lies, distortion of history, and racism and ultimately prevailed. Since 1993, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt has been the DeRote Professor of Modern Jewish and Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. A powerful advocate for the Jewish people, Deborah has led the fight against anti-Semitism for decades. Her recent book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, details the resurgence of anti-Semitism today and is a clarion call for us all to take notice and to take action to stop it in its tracks. It is our privilege and pleasure to invite Dr. Lipstadt to speak with us here tonight. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I've never been introduced by three people, but I like it, and I think I'll recommend it when I go out to speak. Uh, in 1972, one day after the Munich Olympics, the massacre at the Munich Olympics, I arrived in Moscow on a mission to visit refuseniks, those Jews who had applied for permission to leave the Soviet Union for family reunification and had been refused. They were called refuseniks. This was the beginning of the refusenik movement. Uh, one day I was walking, it was the time of Rosh Hashanah, and one evening I was walking with a very prominent, well-known refusenik, and we were being followed by a KGB car. And it wasn't that we were so smart to uh, see the KGB car, but the car wanted to make it known to us that we were being followed. I asked my uh, host, the, the refusenik, how do you deal with this constant surveillance? And he said, many ways, including humor. So I said, humor, give me an example. And he told me the following joke. Word goes out in Moscow that a store is going to receive a shipment of shoes. And those of you who know, know the late unlamented Soviet Union know that consumer goods were in very short supply. 
People didn't care what style the shoes were, what size the shoes were. They wanted to get shoes so they could buy them and then barter them for other things. Uh, so it was a January day. Uh, and the shoes were going to arrive the next night. Early in the evening before, people line up. They stay there overnight. The line grows and grows. By early in the morning, people are frozen solid. It's time for the store to open. The manager comes out and says, we're not going to open yet, but I see from the line there are not going to be enough shoes for everyone. Jews go home. No Jew is getting shoes. So the Jews leave and go home. A few hours later, he comes out, there are not going to be enough shoes for everyone. All non-communist party members go home. So the non-communist party members go home. So it goes through the day, there are not going to be enough shoes. All non-veterans of the Great War, World War II, go home. Finally, 5, 6 in the afternoon, people, these people have been in online close to 24 hours, frozen solid. All that's left are a group of uh, medal-wearing, you know, veterans of the war who had won the great highest medals. They're the only ones left online. The owner comes, the owner, the manager of the store comes out and says they're not going to be enough, they're not going to be any shoes for anyone, everyone go home. So as two of these metal bedecked veterans of the war, loyal Communist Party members walk away from the store, one says to the other, those Jews, they have all the luck. <laughs> the absurdity of such, of such a statement is clear to you but it reflects the absurdity of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a form of prejudice. Think of the word prejudice. Prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. It is utterly ridiculous, as is any prejudice. But what is anti-Semitism? Some Jews and I think sometimes they're right. They say, I can't define it, but just like Potter Stewart said in his famous Supreme Court decision about uh, uh, pornography, I, may, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. We have, just like some people have gay dar and some people have other, we have anti-Semitism dar. We can know it, we know it when we see it. Another definition often given of anti-Semitism is someone who hates Jews more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> now, it sounds amusing, but it's really true. I may hate you because you're an obnoxious person or because I don't know, you know, for whatever reason, I hate you. But if I hate you one iota more because you are a Jew, that's anti-Semitism. So too, if it were a black person, if you hated them one iota more because they're black, that's racism. But actually, there is a way of defining of anti-Semitism and identifying it. We look for three characteristics. One, some reference to money, some reference to financial power. Two, some reference to intellect or smarts, but not used positively, used maliciously, cunning nefarious, using it to their advantage, and three, a power to punch above their weight. Small in number, but they control whatever it might be that the anti-Semite is talking about. And I, as I said earlier, anti-Semitism is a form of prejudice, but it's different. It's different from other prejudices, certainly, let's say, in comparison to racism. The racist punches down. The racist says, if that person of color comes into our building, if their kids move into our schools, whatever it might be, there goes the neighborhood, there goes the school. They look at them with contempt. They're lesser than, they will take us down. The anti-Semite, in contrast, says, those Jews may be fewer in number, but if they, get involved, they will take over. They will use their smarts, they will use their power to hurt us. The anti-Semite, who is generally the same person as the racist, punches up. So that people of color are, and many, and, and Muslims and others, that prejudice, they're to be feared. The Jew is to be feared and to be loathed. The Jew is to be feared for what they might do to us. It is a conspiracy theory of massive proportions. Today we see anti-Semitism from the right, we see it from the left, we see it from Islamist extremists. And one of the most useless, 
time-consuming and wasting debates I often hear, particularly within the Jewish community, is which is worse, anti-Semitism from the left or from the right? They're both bad and they present in different ways. And if you look at only one side, I just recently uh, described a, a person of the left as the Moshe Dayan of anti-Semitism. He only saw it on the right, but the people on the right who only see it on the left. Um, even Holocaust denial can be understood as a form of anti-Semitism. Let's say you were to get on a plane, and I get on planes, I never talk to the person next to me. I came back from Germany yesterday, nine and a half hours in complete silence. I don't want to talk. Because, you know, the, oh, about the Holocaust, tell me about it. I don't, you know, if at worst they're a nudnik, at best, you know, it could be much... It's a long trip to have a nudnik asking you questions. But let's say you sat next down next to a denier. And you asked them, what do you do? And they said, oh, I write about the Holocaust. And let's say you were tabla rasa about the history of the Holocaust. They, oh, it's a terrible thing. I don't know much about it. And they were to say to you, oh, you should know. You'll be glad to know it didn't happen. And they go into their harangue. The natural question you would ask at the end of their harangue is, but why? Why would the Jews have made up this story? What's in it for them? And the answer, you would say, if you ask someone, what did the Jews get out of the Holocaust? And it's hard to say, we got out of anything, we got something out of something that killed one out of every three Jews on the face of the earth. But the answer often given is the state of Israel and reparations. Now, the state of, answer of the state of Israel is not really correct because there would have been something. There would have been some entity e without the Holocaust, but that's the perception. And reparations, of course, is a fancy word for money. There you have an answer. The p power of the Jews, the power of the Jews to get Germany to acknowledge a wrong they didn't commit, to get the Allies to have the Nuremberg trials. A small group in number, but look what they were able to engineer, and why did they do it? In order to enrich themselves. In other words, to the anti-Semite, it makes sense. And today we see a resurgence of anti-Semitism, and of course, as you, all of you know, but also of Holocaust denial, not the hardcore Holocaust denial, which is what I fought in court, but more softcore Holocaust denial. Wasn't so bad. Why do we always hear about the Holocaust? Why are the Jews always going on about the Holocaust? Why, why this genocide? I'll tell you why. As I mentioned a, day, a moment earlier, in the space of 1941 through middle of 1945, actually end of 1944, one out of every three Jews on the face of the earth was murdered. Two out of every three Jews on the European continent was murdered. And these murders continued. Take the Jews, it wasn't just on the European continent. The island of Rhodes, one of the oldest Jewish communities, probably as old as the Roman Jewish community. When were they deported? Six weeks after the landing at Normandy. In other words, the war is already, it's not yet at its end, it's gonna go on for another close to a year, but, but they're so desperate to kill every Jew they can. There is a demented quality to anti-Semitism which makes it an even greater danger. And as I said, we see it on the right and we see it on the left. On the right, think about Charlottesville and the people marching in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us. What did they mean by that? They meant that they, there is a belief on the right, not everyone on the right certainly, but certainly on the far right, and those closer into the center as well, um, of white Christian replacement theory, that there is a plan afoot for black people and brown people to invade the European continent, to invade our, our, uh, the, our country from the south. But these people, the racist says, punching down, they're not smart enough to do this on their own. They're being manipulated. Someone is controlling this. Who is it? The Jew. 
Jews will not replace us. What was the killer in Pittsburgh yelling as he was being brought down by the SWAT team to the people he, was, he had killed and those who he hadn't yet, who he still wanted to kill? You won't destroy the white race. What about on the left? On the left, you get something a little different. You get a structural anti-Semitism. We see it in the British Labour Party. We see it in this country as well, even amongst some members of Congress, where they look upon the Jew, they see a white, pe white people, even though those on the right don't see us as white, and they see all of us as people of privilege, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows that that's the wrong perception of Jews, that there are many Jews who are not of privilege. But they say these are people with power. If you have power, you can't be a victim of prejudice. And me, as a liberal person, I couldn't be a purveyor of prejudice. So it's a phony charge. They don't take it seriously. What do we have to do? We have to demand of the world, A, take this seriously. We have to demand of the world, see this as a human rights abuse, as, as you see all other human rights abuses. What, what must we do? We must become the unwelcome guest at the dinner party. When you hear, paraphrasing the TSA, when you hear something, you must say something. Even if it's a joke, because these jokes aren't funny. And every genocide begins with words. There is no genocide that began with action. Whether you're talking about the Holocaust, whether you're talking about the Armenian Genocide, whether you're talking about Rwanda, it all begins with words. The time to stop it is when they're just words, not much later. What must we do also, and sometimes this is hard to do, we can't fight one-ism without fighting all other isms. We've got to stand up and say it's ethically wrong, it's morally wrong, because if it may start with the Jews, it doesn't end with the Jews. It may start with other groups. It will reach us. Tonight, we come to honor the partisans among us, the memory of partisans, the contribution of partisans, many of whose names we'll never know. On some level, they were the lucky ones. When I teach my courses on the history of the Holocaust, and I get to my, the section on, on resistance and uprising, whether we're talking about the Warsaw Ghetto or Vilna or the many other ghetto uprisings, or, and of course the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was the first armed uprising against the Nazis anywhere on the European continent. Not the first armed Jewish armed uprising against the Nazis anywhere on the European continent. I look at my students, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I can see Jew, non-Jew, it doesn't matter what religion, what ethnicity, what color, they were all thinking, if I was there, that's who I would have been. But we know it's not that simple. Would you have left the ghetto if you had an older, a parent who was at 45 was considered old, and you knew if you escaped, they would be then deported? We don't know what we would have done. And we know so many who would have wanted to be able to pick up a gun and fight, or to somehow sabotage, to say we are not going down quietly, we're not going down silently. We honor those who were lucky enough to do this. And on some level, I have to tell you, even though I was involved in this long legal battle, which ultimately went on for about six years, and, and sapped my energy and took all my attention, and wasn't fun. In the end, we won, and there was a movie and all that. That's nice, but I can tell you, it wasn't fun. I would have much rather it never happened. But I have to say that on some level, even after writing this book and spending three years in the sewers of anti-Semitism, writing about contemporary anti-Semitism and having pe pe spent the past seven months since it came out, traveling worldwide, I just came back from Germany yesterday, I go back again in 10 days, I go to Norway, etc., talking about this topic. I have to tell you that at some level, I feel blessed. It seems a strange thing to say but I feel blessed because I have had the chance, and I have the chance, to stand up to those who, will, who hate us. 
I've spoken to so many Jews who feel so frustrated. What can I do? I feel like on some level, very small, I'm not comparing myself in any way, but I feel blessed like I think many of those partisan fighters must have felt blessed that they could stand up and do something. We all in our way must stand up and do something. You're here tonight, you're supporting education, that's one thing. Speak out. Ask, tell people they must take this seriously whether it's coming from the right, whether it's coming from the left. And the final point, and with this I close, at the same time that we make this our battle, and we say we're, we're not going to let this go down silently, we also have to protect against something else. Last chapter of my book I call Oi versus Joy. And we have to be careful at this moment when so many of us are worried and so many of us are concerned about this threat, of letting the threat of what others might do to us become the defining force of who we are as Jews, of letting us become Jew as object, what is done to Jews, as opposed to Jew as subject, what Jews do. We are not Jews because the, over so many generations, as we say in the Haggadah, omdim aleinu l'chalotenu, there are those who've risen up to try to destroy us. We're Jews despite their efforts, despite the efforts of the National Socialists, the Nazis, and so many others to do us in. We remain Jews because of the heritage we have, of all we have given to the world, of, of what it is that is inside of us, that, that pintle yid, as some of your ancestors might have said, that little bit of that Jew. We are so much more than victims. We have given so much to the world, and you are here today to say, we remember their contribution, we teach about it so that we can, can uh, our generation, next generations, the many young people we have seen up here tonight, which has been a thrill to watch, will continue to the give to the world because of the joys of Judaism, despite the efforts of the world to harm us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lipsat. I, I want everyone to know that her wonderful, wonderful book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, is available to everyone here as a thank you gift for coming, and she was kind enough to sign every copy for every family. So thank you very much, Dr. Lipstadt. So before I have the honor to say what I'm gonna say, I just wanna quickly give an update on that little, our little fundraiser here that we had. Um, we are about $6,500 away from our goal, about $50,000. So I'm very, very excited about that. For those of you who still are a little daring who want to help us get there, if you want, just briefly, you're going to send a text to 4144. You're going to text partisans and your name. And then you're going to get a text back. And at that opportunity, you'll have the opportunity at that point to put in your credit card information. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. There's no rush. If you're feeling like you want to help us, you're able to. We would be grateful. But we're so grateful that everyone came here tonight. So thank you. All right, here we go. You know, it's been 20 years, almost, since I first met a partisan, and I was inspired to start JPEF. I never could have imagined the impact we would have as an organization teaching millions of young people about the Jewish partisans. Many of you were there at the beginning, and I'm grateful to all of you who continue to make this work possible. Thank you, everyone, for joining this movement to support the vision that every young person in the world should learn about the resistance of the Jewish partisans during the Holocaust. You're all helping make this a reality. Thank you. I want to give a special shout out to my son, Ben, and my mom, Janet, who came with here, me tonight. 
Thank you, Ben. I hope I don't embarrass you by saying that. I am so grateful to introduce our honoree, Diane Wall, tonight. Honoring Diane is meaningful to me for so many reasons. We are grateful for her and Howard's philanthropy and tireless advocacy and support for JPEF. And over, over the last 12 years, Diane and I have known each other. We've become dear, dear friends. Around 12 years ago, Diane attended a JPEF workshop at a BBYO conference in Chicago. She was so intrigued by what she saw and heard, she gave her contact information to the workshop leader who told me about this amazing woman she had met who wanted to talk to me, and I called her. About two months later, Diane and I were sitting together in a restaurant on Park Avenue. She was telling me how impressive JPEF was. Diane explained that JPEF was the missing piece in the field of Holocaust education for her. There was simply nothing like it. She noted that she and Howard are major funders of the U.S. Holocaust Museum and the Shoah Foundation, and JPEF was something they wanted to support. I was thrilled and humbled by her gesture. Diane and Howard have been major supporters and champions of JPEF ever since. What I soon learned about Diane, though I wish I would have Googled this before we met, I had no idea who this woman was that I was having coffee with. She is deeply involved in supporting Jews outside North America through Padilla, providing training for young Jewish leaders in Europe and, throughout, and through Lemud FSU, helping Jews from the former Soviet Union. Her leadership of Project Kesher helps Jewish women living in the FSU realize their potential in more open societies. Diane's interest in Holocaust education has led to leadership positions at the U.S. Holocaust Museum and support for the USC Shoah Foundation. She has also held key volunteer roles at the UJA Federation of New York, the Jewish Theological Seminary, APAC, and Hillel International. Diane has been deeply involved and supports Hillel's efforts in South America, Europe, and Israel. She has served as president of Temple Beth Torah in Long Island and is a longtime board member of Hofstra Hillel. She and Howard have truly changed the face of both Holocaust education and of Jewish life across the world. They have contributed thousands of hours of their time as volunteers and millions of dollars in philanthropic support. While we honor Diane tonight, Howard is also a tremendous inspiration leader in many prominent organizations. I know of no other couple who has given so much of their time and resources in the interest of making the entire world a better place. I don't think they will ever retire, and thank God for that. One of JPEF projects Diane was instrumental in bringing to life was our photo exhibit of Jewish partisan photographer Faye Shulman. Not only did Diane and Howard serve as major donors, hey, with all due respect, please, I know some of you are chatting. I don't mean to interrupt, but please just run the home stretch here, okay? Shh. Thank you. Not only did Diane and Howard serve as major donors, allowing the exhibit to happen in the first place. They hosted Faye and it had a JPEF event in their home. Diane also literally knows everyone. Around the same time, JPEF brought the Faye Shulman exhibit, the Lions of Judah conference in Israel. At the hotel in Tel Aviv, Diane and Howard's in that hotel room with Faye, there was a knock at the door. The door was, Behind the door was Jennifer Granholm, the governor of Massachusetts, who heard they were in town and wanted to say hello. Diane and Howard are very engaged in U.S. politics and have donated significant funds to candidates in key congressional and presidential contests all over the country who share their progressive values. Diane makes time for so many people. Recently, at Diane's home, I met a young man from another Jewish institution that Diane supports. When I witnessed how thoughtful she was with him, it reminded me how gracious she was to me when we first met. 
I joke with Howard that Diane seems to collect Jewish organizations to support and their leadership to mentor. Howard smiled knowingly. It made me appreciate all the people and organizations that she has helped over the years. I think it's safe to say that if we put all the people and organizations Diane, Diane has impacted in this room, the fire marshal, marshal would close us down. Diane, you are an inspiration to us all. On top of everything you have done this all while raising three wonderful children who have made you the most proud Safta with six incredible grandchildren who as accomplishments you are always sharing when we meet. It is so fitting to honor you this evening as we celebrate Jewish women partisans. You are like the women partisans, our women of valor. Please everyone, help me welcome Diane Wall. And it gives me pleasure to present to you the Lev Arhe Award. Oh my God. And a wonderful, I'm going to take these. And we have some wonderful quotes from people in your life who love you, including me here and other important people. I'm going to take both these away so you don't have to carry them. And they'll be waiting for you after. Thank you Thank so you. much. I don't know about you, but I am so exhausted from all these wonderful things that you said about me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I know it's getting, you know, late, and so I'm going to um, speed through my remarks. But I'm so happy to be here, and I just, just adore this um, organization, and so thankful for it. Uh, and as Nick said, it bears repeating. Besides, thank you for your remarks. I'm sure you remember that my introduction to JPEP took place at a BBY international convention. For that, I thank my husband, Howard, who was then BBYO international board chair, for bringing me to the IC. Go BBYO. It was there that JPEF had a staff person who introduced us to the story of the partisan. I knew then that I had to meet JPEF's founder, and as they say, the rest is history. Though I had already been immersed in the history of the Holocaust and have been engaged with the U.S. Holocaust Museum and the USC Shoah Foundation for many years, I knew very little about the partisans, other than the story of Hannah Senesch, which I had read about when I was much younger. Her activism, heroism, and defiance in the face of the greatest evil in modern history made me feel proud. Wait, I have another paper, sorry. Now it is about a decade later, and over these years I have learned firsthand of the bravery of Jewish women partisans. They fought with unabashed courage under impossibly difficult conditions to take up arms against the Nazi killing machine. In doing so, they proved that Jews could and did fight back. To all the Faye Shulmans who with a rifle on one shoulder and a camera in hand brought visual proof of what the Nazis hope would never be revealed. And to the Sonia Orbachs whose innocence and childhood was erased forever, who could imagine Jewish teenagers bombing Nazi railroad tracks and doing whatever was necessary to survive? In order to mount a resistance against a machine of such unvarnished hate, numerous groups of partisans consisting of men, women, and children were formed. Together, each group became a family, supporting each other in the darkest days of the war. Each group chose its leader, who then determined the rules that were responsible for saving many lives. No matter how many books we have read and stories we had either heard firsthand from the survivors or listening to their testimonies, none of us could ever imagine the scale of inhumanity that was perpetrated on innocent victims. In total, 11 million, including 6 million Jews, were murdered 
because a madman decided that these people did not fit his profile of the Aryan race. If he and his henchmen had not been stopped, Hitler would have continued his mission until no Jew was left. Thankfully, we have JPEF. It's found a Mitch Graf developed the curriculum based on Jewish value that teaches the lessons of the Holocaust. JPEF, in turn, trained teachers who over the years have taught hundreds of thousands upon thousands of teenagers to have the courage of their convictions to stand up to bullies and to be mentors to others. And most of all, that all of us never forget what happened between 1933 and 1945, when too many did not heed the warnings emanating from Europe. Sadly, too many did not have the courage to make a difference when they could have and should have and did not. How grateful we are to those he did. I want to congratulate my fellow honoree, Cantor Shira Ginsburg and to the courageous women partisans who are here this evening and those who are at home, we gratefully recognize you for affording us a Jewish future. Thanks go as well to Sherry Rosenblum, or Blaum, or Baum, <laughs> and her team who worked so diligently to make this evening so memorable. And a personal call out to my friend, Deborah Lipstadt, who has worked so hard for so long to raise the world's conscience about the Holocaust and today's reemergence of anti-Semitism and other form forms of hatred of the other. And this is why <clears throat> we cannot stand idly by. We owe it to those who were murdered and to those who survived never again. And of course, to my dear friend Mitch Graff, you have created this organization that has shined a light on the untold story of Jews who fought back during the Holocaust. I am so proud to be a part of JPEF and so touched by this honor bestowed upon me. Thanks to my friends who are here this evening and everybody who cared enough to be part of this night. And most of all, to my extraordinary family from the East Coast and the West Coast. You mean the world to me, and I love you all so dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for being here. I am Matt Belsky, the grandson of Sonia and Zeus Belsky. Tonight is my, it is my privilege to present Cantor Shira Ginsburg, third generation leader and educator with the Heart of Lion Award for empowering young people through the struggles of the Jewish partisans. The granddaughter of the partisans Judith and Martha Ginsburg, Shira has dedicated her life both professionally and personally in sharing her grandparents' experiences as Jewish partisans with future generations. Shira has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to presenting an accurate history of Jewish resistance, which manifests itself in her work as a cantor, a Jewish educator, an actress, and of course, through her dedication to her family and her very special relationship with Bobby Judith. The collective words of the Ginsburg cousins illustrates us best. From your very name, Shira, which means song, it seems as if you were destined to lead, the, to lead with your beautiful Jewish voice. You have spoken for all of us in your telling of our grandparents' stories and ensuring that the stories of thousands of others are preserved for future generations. Our, our generation, the grandchildren of Judith and Marvin Ginsburg, are proud to honor you, our sister, and our cousin in this important pursuit and this wonderful honor. Shira honors her grandparents fight to preserve the Jewish lives more than 75 years ago through her own dedication of the Jewish community through her work as a cantor at East End Temple 
here in Manhattan, <laughs> and through her work as a Jewish educator. Her devotion to empowering others through the lessons of the Jewish partisans can be found in her work as an actress and playwright. In 2016, Shearer premiered her one-woman musical, Bubby's Kitchen, or Broadway, and since then, she has brought this to more than 25 communities throughout the country. Shear has actively led JPEV's third generation group in its mission to bring the inspiration of the Jewish partisans into classrooms everywhere through 3G testimony using JPEV's educational materials. As a founding member of the Shear generation of Holocaust survivors, we educate. Shira teaches Holocaust studies in schools throughout the five boroughs. Your Bubby, who will be honored, who, who we honored earlier this evening, but could not be here today, says it best. Shira, I feel such pride, joy, and comfort knowing that our family's history, as well as the memories of those who survived and those that perished, will live on through your voice. I love you, Shira, with all my heart. Shira, please join me on stage so that I present you with J Puff's 2019 Heart of Lion Award. I'm the last speaker. Okay, so good evening. There are a lot of papers up here, so hang on one second. I'm just gonna move some things around. Great, okay. I am really honored and very overwhelmed with gratitude for this incredibly moving recognition of my efforts to continue on the lessons of my grandparents and for that matter, all of our partisan parents and grandparents. I'd like to say mazal tov to Diane Wall and a sincere thank you to Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, which we can't see, but really for your incredible words. A heartfelt thank you to Mitch Braff, to Elliot Felsen, to Sherry Rosenblum, and to the entire JPEF board for this honor. Thank you to my East End Temple community who's here tonight. To my family of Ginsburgs. And to all of you who are here this evening in support and celebration of the women of the partisans. And also a very happy 70th birthday to my mom who chose to celebrate her birthday here with all of us tonight. As a grandchild of partisans, the past and the present have always been intertwined. And the question of how to continuously move towards the future while simultaneously honoring the past is one I ask myself on a daily basis. And I know that I am not alone in this questioning. The same is certainly true for every single person sitting in this room tonight. The poet Yehuda Amichai immortalizes this struggle in his poem Shir in Sophie, a song without end. In a modern museum, in an old synagogue, in the synagogue, I, within me, my heart, within my heart, a museum, within a museum, a synagogue, within it, I, within me, my heart, within my heart, a museum. Amichai offers us a haunting visualization of our people's internal and eternal polarity of past and present. Simply put, he defines for me exactly what it means to be a Jew. I have never been a person solely defined by my own accomplishments. I have always been a part of something bigger than myself, a part of the Ginsburg family, a part of the people of Israel who suffer and who celebrate together, 
who protect and take responsibility for one another. I learned how to be a Jew in my Bubby and Zadie's home, in between the Vorspeis and the chicken soup, a story would always emerge. Like of the night my Zadie saved a contingent of 12 men from his partisan unit, Iskra. After a successful mission blowing up a train, they stopped at a farmhouse, and in celebration of the success, all of the Russian partisans were drinking. My Zadie was the only Jew amongst these men and he was the only one who didn't drink because it was Yom Kippur. And his mother had reminded him of that just before he left for this mission. He was the only one awake and alert when his unit was ambushed and the farmhouse was burned to the ground. It is to his credit that every single person in the unit escaped that night, not a single casualty. And then later after dinner, when Bubby and I would be sitting at the kitchen table, dipping our mandel bread into our glasses of tea, more stories would emerge. While working in the laundry in the Lida ghetto, a German SS officer kissed my Bubby. She was 16. Her knee-jerk reaction was to slap him hard across the face a reaction that could have gotten her and all of her fellow workers killed. And instead, the officer saw what so many others have seen when they look into her eyes. Fire and determination. A will not just to live, but to live with pride and honor, to live by a code of ethics. That soldier went like this and treated her with respect from that moment on. Whenever I personally face a difficult challenge, it is not an exaggeration to tell you that I am transported in my mind to the Naloboki Pushka, where my Bubby was handed a gun on her very first night with the Ryszczynski unit and told to stand guard. At 16, she was completely alone in the world, just days before her entire Family was forced on the trains to Majdanek. This was the first of many times that she would hold a gun to fight for her survival and the survival of her people. If ever I am to doubt what I am capable of or what any 16-year-old girl is capable of or what any woman is capable of, I think of my Bubby on that night and every night thereafter. These stories seem impossible, and yet we all know just how very real they are. We as descendants of these incredible heroes are charged with a mantle of responsibility to teach and to interpret these critical lessons for our children for our coworkers, for our neighbors who grew up with no such vocabulary, with no innate or visceral knowledge of what it means to be a people hunted and vilified, who literally rose from the ashes and came out of the forests 30,000 strong. The temple inside my museum, inside my heart, is my Bubby's Kitchen. Thank you. That's very encouraging, thank you. And also the people in it. More specifically, the people sitting at those two tables right there, and most specifically, my Bubby, who is on FaceTime right now. If everybody can wave to her, Bubby, we love you. So I want to conclude by sharing just one more story with you. My Zaidi's brother, Tsalke. He was one of the only partisans to be awarded the hero of the Soviet Union. This is the highest honor of Russia for his bravery, including blowing up 22 Nazi trains. The head general of all of the partisans in Belarus, General Platon, also recommended my Zaidi for this very same honor for his bravery 
and his heroic accomplishments, including having blown up 17 Nazi trains and the Tartak, a major power plant that was completely debilitated after this attack and never used again. Though Maizadi did receive a red star and he did receive the Order of Lenin and many other medals, the Russian commander who turned Maizadi down for this highest honor told him that he did so because he believed that Maizadi was more loyal to being a Jew than a communist. Nothing could be more true. I, like my Zadie, like all Ginsburgs, I am more committed, we are more committed to being Jews than anything else in this world. So on behalf of my family, on behalf of my Bubby, I thank you all so much for this incredible honor. Thank you. And Ms. Graff, you're welcome. So in the spirit of trying to get you guys home, we ran a little bit late. Um, we're not gonna do the last part, the Hatikva and National Anthem because we want to respect the time. What? No? All right, now we're doing Shira. We need, we're doing Atikva, all right. And then we're gonna go to bed. We broke, thanks to some very generous donors, we made our, we broke our limit. We have raised tonight about $490,000. Thank you so much, everyone here. We are so grateful. Thank you, thank you. Shira, Hatikva, do it, take it away. Great, let's all rise. Are the words up there for you? Yes? Great. Call Lord Balev of Pinima, Nefesh Yehudi, O Mia. Ulfate Mizrach Kadima Ayin Letzion Sophia O Edlo Avda Tikva Tainu Hatikva Bach no talpaim, Leo tamachov she be artsenu eretzion virushalayim, Leo tamachov she. Be our tenu, be eretzion, Virushalayim.